So on this drawing here, again, I'm mentally visualizing what's taking place in this action. So from number 16, if I just back up these few drawings here, 15, 16 to 1, and I put them on here, I'm not going to just guess at where my number one arm position is. I'm going to base it on what the action would be dictated by the path of action of the arm here. So in this action here, I'm almost thinking that for this drawing here, number 15, it almost feels like, see the path of action that I drew there? That's almost where the forearm should be, is up in that position right there. And as it follows down here, we're now into a situation where this is the motivator, this ball here on the elbow is the part that's pulling. So therefore, the forearm has to follow that path of action. So if my path of action is coming down like this, I'm just drawing the line between that ball there and this one here, and then I follow that through on this one, there's my path of action right there. Essentially, my forearm has to follow that path of action. It has to be along the, that same line, especially at the fastest point, which is right in here. So therefore, this line of action that's right here, that's where my forearm is going to go. Okay, so I'm just going to draw it in like that, and that would be my wrist point there. Okay, so when I come down to this point here, what I can do is I can choose to keep that path of action there, or what I can do is I can swing the wrist down slightly. So instead of putting it right here, I'm going to just pop it just a little bit down here, so that the weight of the, the wrist here is pulling it down and opening up the, the bicep part. So let me just double check my distance there. Just rotate it over. And just put a little tick there for where my elbow has to be. So now I again just go straight ahead through here and follow the action that's taking place. So when I get to number two here, based on what's happening here to here to here, I have to continue opening the arm. So here it's bent. Okay. Here it starts to open up. I've got to continue opening up the arm. I can't suddenly close it now. So you have to follow the action naturally. If it's starting to open, you have to continue to open it until it reaches the extre extreme position where it can't go any further. Or perhaps it could. We'll see that when we get to the end. I'm going to actually break the elbow at the end and have it reverse direction. Yeah, I know it sounds cruel, but <laughs> we'll have to put a snapping sound into the, the action. But now we're opening the arm, so therefore the angle of the, the forearm in the next drawing must be more than this one here. So I can't just take this, shift it, and trace this one off here and put the arm in that exact same position like this, because then what that means is that I'm locking the muscle there and not allowing that to swing freely. Okay. You could do that if you if you did that mechanical type thing, but remember I said let's not do that. So therefore, if that's the position from the previous drawing, I therefore have to open the arm out further on the next drawing here, like this. Okay. So it's going to open out. So it creates a looser type of feel to that arm, like it's not the muscles are not constraining the forearm. So now when I go to my next drawing here, this is where we're starting to ease into the high point. So once again, i got to make the choice decision when I shift and trace this over here. There's the position that it was in before. I want to go beyond that. Although looking at it here, you could say, well, that's logical just to keep it there. Okay. You could hyperextend or extend it to its extreme position right out there, which is the point where you can't bend your elbow back any further. That would be logical too. So I think that's what I'll do for this one is I'm just going to keep this line straight out, locked out like that, and assume that that's the farthest point that the elbow can go for this drawing here, and then I'm going to hyperextend it on the next one. Okay, so out like that, and then when we get to this point here, this is where now I'm reversing my direction up here. The shoulder's starting to come down, the elbow's still going up, so what I want to do here is continue this part up here. So I think what I'll do is I'll take the elbow here and I'm going to keep it in that position. Maybe just push it ever so slightly over a little bit. Okay, so it's straightening out just a little bit more, but it's not breaking yet. I'm going to wait for the break until the elbow changes direction. Okay, and that's my overlapping action. So it's going to continue out like this, easing into that position there, 
Here's where my elbow reaches its high point now. So I'm going to continue with that angle and push it just ever so slightly more. In actual fact, what I'm going to do is I'm going to straighten the arm completely. So it's going to go to that position right there. Okay, so as we're going through this project now, I don't know if you're noticing it or not, but the process that I talked about before about planning your animation, about visualizing it in your head, acting it out with your own body, etc., etc., I'm not doing any of this here, right? The reason for this is because I know what the assignment is. I've done the assignment before, I know what the principle is, and what I'm doing is I'm just trying something different, but I'm using logic. I'm saying, is this logically where it would go? And the rules say you can only do certain things. So we know you have to slow in, slow out. We know that you have to overlap the action where one part goes down, the other part's going to go up. So I'm using those rules to dictate where my arm is going to go. So as I started this path of action here, I just made that up on the spot. Then what I did was I followed through with what the elbow would do logically based on what the shoulder is doing. And now what I'm doing is I'm making decisions as I go along because I really don't know okay, what this is going to end up looking like. I have a vague idea, but I really don't know because I'm just going with the flow. But I'm following logically what should happen next. Right? And that's where you have to be going with your animation. So I'm hoping for the best, but knowing that if I follow the rules, it's going to work. Right? So here we're easing up into this position here. And now here's where my elbow is actually coming in this direction here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pop it just a little bit. Ever so slightly. So the difference in the angle there is minimalistic. If I put these two drawings over top of each other, you'll see, see the difference there. It's very, very minor. It's almost a trace off actually for the positioning of it. So what that does, that creates a delay it just hovers it, holds it in that position. So here's an instance again where in the future when you're moving your characters from one position to another remember this basic principle here, you can write this down okay? not everything has to move at the same time some things can pause so you can have one part of your body which is completely static but another part is moving it's not like everything has to be moving all the time you can have different parts stop and just be held in that position while another part of the body moves through. And that's really the pure definition of what overlapping action is. That not everything happens at the same time. Right? So don't feel like everything's got to move, everything's got to move. So we're easing up into that position. So now here is where I'm going to start to loop it over and pull it. So now it's actually moving in this direction here. So again, logically I can't break the elbow at this point because there's nothing that's causing the elbow to break here. There's no action that's taking place, it's just being pulled sideways. So I sort of have to still follow the same basic premise here. But if I draw it out like this, I've got to keep the elbow out like this in this position. Okay, where's that going to take my wrist? It's going to take my wrist up. Okay, so that's still an overlapping action where the wrist is going up and over this way and now here's where I get to break it because look what happens here when my elbow goes down like that if I follow this path of action that I've created with my wrist let's just go back here to this position here see my wrist is down here then it comes up to here in the next drawing and up to here and if I go to the previous drawing it's down here and on the previous drawing before that it's down here so see those dots they are creating my path of action looping around here. So it's getting slower in this part here. This is where it starts to speed up. That's its slowest point there. It starts to speed up here because this one is smaller than this one here. So now when I go to this position, here's the loop that has to take place coming down like this. Okay. So if I use my arm in its straight out position out here, it would come out to here. That's where the logical path of action would be if I kept the arm straight. 
But if I do that, when I flip these drawings like this, if I keep my arms straight like that, that looks weird. It looks too stiff. So in order to do the overlapping action, here's where I'm going to put my elbow. I'm going to snap it like that. Okay. So now it's going to drag in behind. Okay. Now I have to maintain the length of it, so I'm just going to shift it over and trace it off and find my end point. So I'm actually going to alter now my path of action over to this point here. So there's a nice drag on it. Now on this one here, okay, we're going to use that weight issue. So I'm not going to follow my path of action running through here. I'm going to let the elbow drag and drop. So I'm going to pop the elbow out like that, drag the arm down there. Okay, so it has more weight to it. Bring it back, trace off. same principle applies on the way back up here now. As I loop out here, it's starting to lose its energy and slow down, so therefore I'm going to start to straighten the arm out here. So it flips out. Okay, so now I have to start to recover the arm. It's going to that position there. I can't maintain that position because what happens is it starts to lock out. So I've got to overlap it. Here's where I start my loop up here in the shoulder. So I look at the distance from this point to this point and I start to slow this part here down. Here's where my elbow begins to loop over. So once again, here's where I can ease this in. Going from this position to this position, I can ease this in to that position right there. And then as the elbow begins to pull out and drop, there's once again where I follow my path of action out here like this, pull it over in this direction here. And here's where I have to go back to 15, which is at the bottom. 15 and 16. I have my 16. I might alter my 16. We'll see what happens here. Because if I put 16 down right now, Let's just see where it's going from and to. So that would require this drawing here. I'm going from this position here to this position here. The path of action on the hand would have to loop over <coughs> in this direction here. So therefore my arm would be right about here like this. That's my in between those positions. There. So that would work. Okay. So now let's take a look at this and see how this looks. Oh, again, I put 15 out of order. I have a question. Yep. Instead of breaking the arms, mm -hmm. would you not? Instead of having it completely straight as it goes down, yeah. curve it back in. Like, you you like, don't 
you, like you could, then it would so create that scooping action. Yeah. So it would be more, more natural to do that. But this action here creates more of a really cool overlap, which is more of what I want to see. Okay. Okay. So I, I do want to see this overlapping action. If you don't want to do it here, like if you want to do a more natural thing where you keep the arm up like this and then you bend it back in this way and keep it straight, maybe hyperextend it slightly on the way down, but so keeping it fairly straight so it's pulling, you can do that, but then we're definitely going to overlap on the hand. Okay. So when we go to put our hand in now, Here's where we get to have the, the full extent of your overlapping action. So from here now, we're going to follow basically what we did in our previous drawing. So I just need 14 and 15 down here. Again, your hand now, because it's shorter, will definitely follow the path of action. Right? There will be a couple of instances in the reversals where we get to break that rule. But here's your path of action coming around here on this part. So therefore, in this, your hand must follow that. So what I want you to do here is just draw your hand in a box form. So in this one here we're going to see the back of the hand and the tip of the fingers like this. So your hand will look like that. Okay, so now we just straight ahead through here again. So here's our path of action coming down here. Path of action is coming down like this bring into a C curve in this direction. So therefore your hand is now going to be up like this. And here we're into the principle of the tail, double ball with the tail. You must maintain that path of action and the direction that the pull is taking place in. So if your path of action is going in a C curve this direction here, you have to curve the fingers back in that direction. You can't scoop your fingers this way. Right? I don't want to see any scooping of the fingers at any point in time. They always have to drag and follow through. All right? That's one of the key things that I'll be looking for when I'm looking at your pencil test. So from here, we're swooping this way. So therefore, we're going to see the back of the hand still. And the fingers are going to be bent back in this direction. Now here's where you get to choose what you're going to do with your hand. If you want to rotate the hand, you can rotate the hand so that as it goes up and back in this direction like this, it's going to rotate around like that so that when it comes back down again, you flip it over this way. Or if you want to, you can do this where it's going to go in this direction, but that might be a little bit awkward to have the hand in that position on the way down. So you just sort of have to feel it through to see what would be the proper path. So from here we're going to swoop in this direction here. You must maintain that. You can start to deviate away from it slightly as the fingertips start to pull out. So as we come up here, we can start to get the fingers to drag out a little bit. So from here, you could do something like this. curve off in that direction. But what I'm saying here is that you can't bend the fingers in this direction here. Or you can't put the hand back in this direction like that, scooping. Right? That's a big no-no. So now as I come up to here, just like that. Here's where I'm starting to hover a little bit so I can start to pull the fingers here in this direction. Because now we're getting to the point of weightlessness. And so this is now where we can start to change the direction at this point. Because now it's starting to come forward and swoop. Okay, so we can do a little bit of a relaxation on the wrist. Like this. Now this is the only point where you can do this. It comes up and around here because it's lost its energy, so now we're starting to release it. And now we pull down hard in that path of action, so here's where we now have to follow back in with that direction right there. And the 
again with this one. There's our path of action right there. Through here. Again, here you can start to relax it a little bit. So let that fingertip drag down a little bit there. And same thing in this one here. You're going to start to pull the fingers out this way, but they still have to curve in the direction that it's moving in. Seaweed action. this point here we're reaching our high point again I can relax the hand a little bit more here and then I have to go back to my number 14 and my 15 here 15 and 16 start to pull a little bit like this. So the wrist is moving more than the fingertips here. And now I've got it in between between these two here. Here's the overall completed piece of animation. Oops, I keep forgetting about 15. Now you'll notice here that because the animation is so close to the top that I'm shifting my hand over to the side and doing a sideways flip. That's got a nice pull to it. Now if you want to see the link up drawings between 16 and 1, so I can't see whether or not this is looping together, what you do is you take half the stack, just split it, that. So now we're saying that number seven is our first drawing, or sorry, number eight would be our first drawing. So we now see our link up connection point. So you can see whether or not that's connecting in properly. A little bit of a flutter on the hand there, which I would go back and correct with the proportions because it gets bigger there. You see as it transitions right in here, from here to here to here, it gets bigger. So I'd have to go back in and just adjust the proportions on those to make it link properly. But that overall action is flowing quite nicely. So there's the idea of what I want you to do with that action. All right. So once we've completed this one for next week, then we're going to go add in and we're going to add on the opposite arm okay, to get the two arms going in opposition to each other. And I'll show you how to do that in the next lecture. All right.